Welcome back to Gold Derby. I'm Christopher Rosen. I'm joined by Joyce saying, Joyce, we're back for season two of Oscar's Playback. Pull up a sofa. It's just us talking. It's Oscar night. No. <laughs> that was Tom Cruise at the 2002 Oscars, Joyce. He, he opened it. Uh, who else? The, the, longest, the longest Oscars ever, the 74th Academy Awards. Uh, four four hours, and a half hours? Well, what's the exact? Time? Four hours and 23 minutes. Yes. A full hour longer than the previous year's ceremony, which we had talked about, I believe, uh, already, because it was when Gladiator won. Yeah, we did that last year. We did. For, I don't know, we just did it. So. We did some bonus episodes. I yeah, think. we did bonus episodes last year. So now we're going to complete the 2000s. <laughs> so we're starting and we're going to do it less chaotically than last season. We're just going to do it in order. Whatever we're just yeah. going to just uh, chronological order here. And uh, that we're skipping The Departed because we already did that last year too. <laughs> did The Departed last year. Uh, this is the 2002 Oscars for the movies of 2001, the 74th annual Academy Awards, hosted by Whoopi Goldberg, a four hour and 23 minute show, which I got to say, loved watching it. I thought this was a great show. Um, did you watch it live back then? So uh, some of it. At the time I was working uh, at a radio job and our, my hours, I believe, were in the morning. So I kind of fell asleep, oh. if I remember correctly. Did you have like a graveyard shift? I had a morning shift. So okay. I had to be up at like 3 a.m. basically. To go. Oh, man. You're just you're just like a, a morning show anchor. I was. Uh, just like me and Reese. Uh, yeah. So I don't remember, honestly, a lot of it. And I got to say, and we'll talk about this now, it, not my favorite year for movies, 2001. No. Not just because of 9-11. Uh, <laughs> I, I did watch this whole show back then. And I just remember being like, you know, put a girl down, like, let's end this right now. <laughs> Cause it was, so I, I was, uh, in high school still. So it was, I was just like, I have, I have school the next day. <laughs> I was out of college. This is a weird, uh, I was like a year, I guess this is two years out of college at this point. Cause I graduated May of 2000. So coming up on a two year anniversary of college graduation, just so if you're watching this and like, what the hell, uh, we're going to go through, uh, this Oscar ceremony. First, we'll talk about the year in film, uh, 2001 in film, our favorite, Wikipedia page, TK in film, TK year in film. Yeah. Then we'll go through uh, the ceremony and we'll go through the winners, see how it went. And we'll pick our own winners and probably re uh, add the, the extra best picture nominees and all of that fun stuff. Um, yeah. And there's a lot of connections with uh, this ceremony um, to this past cycle ceremony, the 95th Oscars. Yes. So, but um, yeah, when I was looking through the year in film, <laughs> last night i was like there are so many films that i never watched again here like i've seen a lot of these movies but just once and i have no interest in watching them again but then there's a handful of films i'm obsessed with and i watch over and over and over again uh i felt the exact same way uh this was like we talked about this i think in the 2000 episode but also how like 99 was like the best year of ever right according to ew and then uh brian raftery's book or whatever and then 2000 was like the 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 slight death rattle after 99 like a lot of like stuff that was still applicable maybe to 99 and then 2001 feels like the real slow like whew, just like a slow slide out uh into whatever it, it's I, I will say like it's a very eclectic year which i i do like so, so i wrote down a bunch of movies joyce that uh i thought were pretty good uh and i just did an order of release tell me what you you had some of these uh memento um you know our our intro basically to chris nolan uh remember seeing in the theater new market i believe released it if i remember correctly and uh it was good and i remember being like this is great good movie well yeah loved it. um i i liked it uh a lot i that that one i have seen more than once but not in a very very long time so that's like mid tier for me yeah same exactly right haven't seen a long time uh another one i loved at, at the time and uh wrote watched it recently the movie made Right. From John Favreau, his follow up to Swingers. Then he did not direct Swingers. He did that's direct. An, Made. That's that's one of the ones I have never seen again. Uh, watched it recently. Still great. Vince Vaughn rules. Uh, Ghost World. Love Ghost World and should have gotten a lot more nominations. One of my favorites and will definitely be highly mentioned here then in this episode because I. But that's agree. also I. That's another one mid tier for me. I've seen it more than once, but not in a while. Uh, I'm missing a bunch of big movies that came out. I just was not super into these. Uh. Hannibal was a big deal at the time, the Silence of the Lambs sequel. 
Yeah, I did not see that one in the theaters because that came out in February. Mm -hmm. I remember this um, because that came out the week after one of my faves that I've seen like at least 20 times, The Wedding Planner. Had my, that favorite, my favorite J-Lo rom-com. Sure. So, and and I just remember Hannibal coming out. I think the week, I think it was a week or maybe two weeks later. And then I was like, do I want to see this? And I decided, no, I don't. Uh, it, incredibly gross. One of those Ridley Scott movies where he's just like unhinged, uh, eating Ray Liotta's brain, uh, Gary Oldman getting eaten by pigs, I think is in this one. It's just a gross. And obviously like Julianne Moore, um, replacing right. Jody. So I think that was also another reason why. And then the, a, a third reason was also, this was at 2002. So the winter Olympics and you know me, I love the Olympics. So I, 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 I would prioritize the Olympics over seeing movies that I may or may not want to see. <laughs> right. Uh, let me see what else came out this year. The Mexican. Did you see that one? I did see that one. Um, this Julian is William Brad. Julia and Brad, and this is also the film on which uh, Julia met her husband, Daniel Mulder. Yes. They're still married, but, you know, a, a lot of gossip at the time, if you recall. And uh, James Gandolfini, like, uh, mm -hmm. breaking out here uh, was a fun uh, the movie's not nearly as good as it should have been. I still no, don't think it's my, my uh, favorite. Well, I have. OK, so my my Brad Pitt movies of 2001 will be Ocean's Eleven. Obviously. Obviously. Can't, the spy yeah. game. Yeah. And then the Mexican. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Josie and the Pussycats and Bridget Jones Diary, two movies I did not see at the time that I've come to like a lot. But I saw Josie in the theaters. I made my mom take me. Nice. Um, the The movie was fine, but Three Small Words, a banger. Three Small Words, a banger. And I got to say, watching it recently, it's awesome. It's like one of those old movies that you're like, was totally mediocre at the time. And now you're like, this is a great movie. <laughs> It's become cultish. Yes. Um, but it was a flop back then. And I remember them promoting it on TRL because uh, Tara Reid was still with Carson Daly at the time. And he obviously is in the movie too. Yes. So as a, in a cameo. Um, so yeah, I remember that the, there was there was a lot of Josie promo on MTV. Uh, other ones here. A lot, of, a lot of blockbusters. Shrek, which we'll talk about. Uh, Pearl Harbor, Michael Bay. Uh making his like Saving Private Ryan. Yeah, that that had a lot of high expectations. This had Oscar buzz maybe? Yeah, that's another one. I I didn't hate the movie, but um it's it's kind of like one I watched sort of ironically. Like I've seen it more than once, but it's just I just love like when, you know, Josh Hartnett dies <laughs> and like you know that Kate Beckinsale is pregnant with his baby. Like you you just know. <laughs> uh big year for Josh Hartnett. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, this year, um, this was also kind of the tail end of um, a teen rom-coms, one of my favorite genres. So we had a lot of those this year, like Get Over It. Save the Last um, Dance. Yeah. And then, well, at the end of the year, we also had not another teen movie, just spoofing them all. Mm -hmm. um, there's Head Over Heels, Sugar and Spice. Um, my favorite of the year, though, is Summer Catch. Freddie oh, Prince. That, that is a good one. Jessica Biel. Yeah. And I, I still, I, I love it because well, it's about baseball, so I love a, a like a good sports rom com too. And to this day, I still sometimes see it like in bars, like you're just playing on the TV in bars. So pretty rewatchable. Re uh, mm -hmm. Night's Tale was another one that was pretty popular. At the one time. of my faves. This is another Great. one I see like fifty times over and over again. And um, my my <laughs> my first memory of this movie is that so it came out on May eleventh. <laughs> And then the day before, May 10th, Heath Ledger was on TRL. I just, so I, I TRL was my favorite show when I was a teenager. Obviously. And Great he show. was on TRL promoting it. And I couldn't really watch it because I I had my uh, global history paper due the next day. It was like, you know, like the final paper of the year. And I was just writing it the day before. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. So, and I didn't have a TV in my room. So I was just going back and forth. Um like trying to write my paper and then like trying to watch his appearance on TRL and I finished the paper handed it in the next day. And then I saw the movie that night. So, wow. Mm -hmm. uh, Ghost world. You mentioned wet hot American summer is another one that I did not see at the time, but these are two movies I've seen a million times since. And like, yeah, really love. same. That, yeah. I didn't, that was so tiny. It was probably just in like two theaters at that time. And when it came out in July and it got just decimated in mm -hmm. the reviews. Yeah. Um, but 
so much fun. Um, and the I I like the they've they've done two Netflix series since. I I prefer first they have camp mm-hmm. over I, ten years later. I don't prefer either of them. I'll stick with the OG. <laughs> uh-huh. Well, also like Bradley Cooper did not come back for ten years. Yeah, later. <laughs> I'm just like uh, it's so t- when these comedy. I mean, this is like this is why I actually really like the last season of the third season of party down is because a lot of times when these comedies come back, they're never any good. Like America, went out America summer. I put in there like arrested development, but anyway, uh, that's another, that's a TV thing. We're not talking about, we're doing the Oscars here, but, but we pulled up the sofa. We're talking movies, uh, legally blonde, huge hit. That was this year. Love legally blonde. My dad took me and my brother to see that great movie. Uh, AI was a big deal. Obviously. I did not care for that. Uh, picking up the baton from Stanley Kubrick. I remember seeing it at Lincoln Square and uh, on an opening week, probably opening day, I think, because again, we were working in the morning. So I remember going after work uh, to see it in like a matinee screening and it did not play great in the theater, I would argue. Uh, Not one of my faves. I don't think I saw that in the theater, but when I eventually, I probably saw in pay-per-view, as you know, I had a legal pay-per-view back then, so... I think I probably saw then and I just I I was like zoning out basically. So it it felt like another um Amistad for Spielberg. Yeah. Uh Moulin Rouge we'll talk a lot about. It. I did not Love see that Moulin theater, Rouge. But I've seen that, it a million times since. Yeah, that I, I share a birthday with Moulin Rouge, so I love that. I right. love sharing a birthday with movies I love. Great. So uh, Fast and the Furious, the original, the OG Fast and Furious. As you know, that's one of the four fast films i have seen incredible that we're now 20 years later here and uh 22 years 22 years later and uh still going strong fast 10 going it's gonna be a trilogy maybe well they'll do the the, it's not a trilogy because they're gonna bring the rock back joyce remember he he's coming back after black adam you gotta come back yeah yeah, he's got it it's been a tough time for the rock uh jay and silent bob strike back i saw in the theater loved it big kevin i didn't see that one in the theater i saw that eventually um fun um that that gets us pretty much through the book through to 9 11 which obviously happened this year well the summer also had um princess diaries princess diaries was a good one great star making performance wonderful um the others the other nicole kidman movie a big year for nicole because her divorce from tom was finalized yes so this is when she came into her own became her own star and i remember i think i still have this issue it's probably at my parents house um, remember EW when it still existed in print? They did Best of the Year. And she was their entertainer of 2001. Nice. I do remember so, that. Yeah. Uh, James Love, Bob Love. And then I have, then I, but none of these are really great. I, I None of these are like on my list of favorite movies. All my favorites from the year are basically backed into like the last few weeks of the year, I guess, after 9 11, basically. Um, I don't really, I think my only one from that point are like Ocean's Eleven and Lord of the Rings. So I wrote down Zoolander, which I absolutely love. I, I like Zoolander, but that's another one I haven't seen in a while. Uh, Training Day was awesome. That was actually the first movie I saw post 9-11. I remember going to the theater and it was mobbed. It was so crowded. And that movie was a big hit. Uh, and it was, uh, we went opening day. Could not wait. Love Denzel. Trailer looked awesome. Movie fucking rules. Let's go. Love the first it. movie I saw in the theater after 9-11 was Ocean's Eleven on opening night. So oh. I lived three months, but it was great because I that that's the only time I actually like sweated on the armrest because I like the final act, even though I knew what was gonna happen, basically, like, you know, I had seen the original. Like, um, but it I, I don't know. It was just like, it was, it was so much fun. And it's just like the suspense of it all. And you're just like in it. So yeah. Um, and still, still the best one. Uh, I think Ocean, I like Ocean's 12, honestly, more. It's one of my favorite movies, but they're both yeah. amazing. And all of these movies are great. Ocean's 11, obviously. Royal Tenenbaums, my favorite Wes Anderson movie, was way in on that. Saw that in the theater. Uh, that was my first movie I saw in 2002. Okay. Uh a great Edward Burns movie, Sidewalks of New York, which I love. Did not see it at the time, but saw it like on VHS probably in 2002. I saw, I saw that on uh, pay-per-view. I remember that. Truly one of his best movies. I just love it so much. It's so good. I rewatched it recently. It still holds up. Edward Burns, come back. Please make stuff. He did uh, the great show that no one watched on uh, 
stars, I believe it was, right? Which I don't even remember the name of. Let me see. Um, was it? I don't even remember. I'm looking right now. It can't, Bridge and Tunnel. Wow. Oh, yeah. Great show. It wasn't even stars. It might have been uh, MGM Plus or something. Or, well, or... now it's MGM Plus. What was it? Before? It was Epics. 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 Yeah. So. Uh, other stuff. Uh, Mulholland Drive and Donnie Darko, two like culty movies that I did not see in the theater, but obviously seen a lot. Amelie, Mulholland I Drive, I saw um, at my friend's sleepover and half my friends fell asleep before the movie was over. Sounds about right. Uh, <laughs> Amelie was a big deal at this time. Cute movie. Mm-hmm. Monsters, Inc. I remember seeing in the theater. Big uh, Pixar movie. I did not see that in the theater. So. Uh, a great David Mamet movie with Gene Hackman. An amazing year for Gene Hackman. Heist. Uh, mm-hmm. Just an awesome heist movie. So good. Completely zero cultural footprint. No one has mentioned heist. This, um, yeah, it was a big year for Gene Hackman and also Billy Bob Thornton. Yes. Uh, Bandits was fun. Bandits was fun and Monsters Ball, obviously, which we'll talk about. Uh, Harry Potter. wasn't there. Yeah, Man Harry Potter, there. I did not see in the theater. I saw hey. it eventually. Um, and then... I and then I read the book and that's the only book I've read of the series <laughs> uh I've ended up reading all the books uh never seen the movies in the theater though until like late much later in the process uh, I've never seen all the movies so this so, movie's not very good but I don't think I don't remember like, it at all so yeah. I've only seen and, it once and, and like you said Lord of the Rings Fellowship of the Ring which is my favorite Lord of the Rings movie I think it's the best it's so good I think so too um and I think it does it it really excels at like the the world building and the world setting yes and it i was thinking about it watching like clips of it before we did this and i'm like it's so uh it's so set the template for like so much television in the last like 20 years not just like game of thrones but and like lost i feel like like any show that has any kind of like uh group setting or like any kind of like quest is like law is like indebted to lord of the rings and the way peter jackson did it i think yeah and it kind of makes me wonder like obviously we knew there were two more coming right so like i it makes me wonder like if it were just one of them like would have it actually won best picture probably not but i don't i don't know but i would say maybe but we'll talk about this i'm like we didn't even mention the best picture winner it was a beautiful mind which came out obviously i've only seen it once uh and uh what else oh and the other ones i wrote down were uh vanilla sky which i love cameron crow movie tom cruise great stuff i, I was definitely there another like, uh cameron diaz near miss so uh loved it so much it was their opening uh, opening day and uh black hawk down which i did not see i i like black hawk down a lot um i uh to to bring it back to the rock the mummy returns his his film debut sure um did you see Lara Croft Tomb Raider no I didn't either uh we the the top movies of the year were Harry Potter box office wise Lord of the Rings Monsters Inc Shrek Ocean's Eleven Pearl Harbor The Mummy Returns and one movie we did not mention at all Jurassic Park 3 I was fully out on the Jurassic Park franchise by this point I don't remember when I saw that I did not see that in the theater no way I possibly never seen the whole thing all the way through um and then what else did I write down I, I wrote down some flops Oh yeah, what do you got? Uh, town and country, big flop. Yeah, huge flop. Um, we mentioned Josie. Oh, this this was this wasn't really a flop, but I like this movie a lot. Um, and it also has now achieved some cult status. Heartbreakers. It's oh yeah, uh huh. Sure. Jennifer Love Hewitt. Yeah, great yeah. film. Um, and then oh, Exit Wounds with DMX. R.I.P. Great. Yeah. Great movie. And. Uh- yeah, like there's a lot of those kind of movies this year. Three thousand miles to Graceland. Remember that one? That was, oh my uh, god! Remember Rockstar with yes. Jennifer Aniston and Mark Wahlberg? Yeah, that came out like right after Labor Day. It was right before nine eleven. It was. It was the last. Um, and then obviously movie. Glitter the week after. Sure. Nine eleven. Um, um, oh, Serendipity. That's another one I I love a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it's probably Jeremy Piven's best performance. Like when he reads um, what's his face's obit <laughs> at the end, John Cusack's. Yep um and that's by game we talked about that was fun oh can and leap mode um yeah a big year for hugh jackman too yes swordfish uh, for sure uh don't say a word was another big one the last oh yeah yeah the I, big, I watched uh, that. michael douglas movie that kind of like reignited the box office after 9-11 mm-hmm. uh yeah just then, weird yeah movie. oh oh um it, well it released in the states in 2001 but in the mood for love 
no sure. like, iconic film so yeah so like we said not the greatest year i would say for movies but there, a lot of variety a lot of rush variety. Hour two, a lot of sequels rush hour two american pie two mm-hmm. planet of the apes reboot which is terrible yeah i don't care for that so Hedwig and the angry inch another indie movie that was like pretty well received at the time uh, a movie called The Score Joyce. Did you see that one in theaters? Edward Norton, Robert De Niro, and Marlon Brando. I did not see that in the theaters, no. I'll tell you what movie would not work in 2023. The Score. Because there's a whole plot about Edward Norton playing a uh, 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 disabled uh, janitor and uh, doing like a voice. I rewatched it recently. It does not that, hold up. Um, Angela Bassett's also in that. She is. Right. She plays Robert De Niro's girlfriend, I believe. Uh-huh. Um, um, I don't know what else. Oh, America's Sweethearts. Did yeah, that was it? another big deal. Yeah, that was, that was a big one. Remember the EW cover for that one, I feel like. Yes, yeah. Uh, Crazy Beautiful with uh, Kirsten Dunst. Yeah, Kiki. Yeah, that, that was a big one. Uh, that came out at the end of June. I remember that. So This was a big year for uh, Halle Berry. Like we said, Swordfish obviously was a big thing uh, and Monsters Ball. Like you said, uh, it felt like uh, we're, we're, we're branding new stars because Kirsten Dunst and Tobey Maguire coming into Spider-Man the next year. Uh, Josh well, that's Hartman. because they're promoting Spider-Man because it's right. coming out in like six weeks. Yes. <laughs> uh, so the Oscars comes in. New uh, new place, Joyce. Kodak Theater. Mm-hmm. Uh, Laura Ziskin is going to produce it. She brings in Whoopi. Uh, there was talk, I guess, right away of not doing the Oscars. It, but it was months after 9-11, so I feel like that maybe was a little overblown, but it was very much a lot more security at this Oscars than ever before. Yeah, and then a lot of the red carpet questions were about the security. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and Woody Allen shows up here, Joyce, which we'll talk about, and he has a, he was like, oh, it was great, something about making up, making up for the strip search uh, to get invited to the Oscars. Uh, can't laugh about that obviously now but you know at the time people were very excited that Woody Allen was going to be there yeah he uh, got a, a standing O so I, I remember it distinctly when when it happened live so this yeah it was yeah I never thought it would be canceled or whatever after 9-11 like this was six months after it was on March 24th um, and I think like they kind of just brush that aside like pretty like whatever speculation about that pretty soon afterward too like maybe like a month or two of you know yeah so it was yeah. it was still a time when the country was united uh somewhat so you can make jokes about politicians but the intro we'll talk about they have the errol morris uh like documentary thing like he they sprinkle that through the show includes uh donald trump who was not yet donald trump he was just some idiot uh, on TV, uh, Laura Bush and Al Sharpton. It's just every every political strife here, Joyce, in, in the intro. And Tom Brady, uh, TB12. Yeah, you know, just like uh, you're united under one banner, so. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so the show opens with uh, Donald Sutherland and Glenn Close as the announcer. Love it. I, yeah, you know, let's it's invite, uh, you know, someone you've never given an Oscar to and someone you've never nominated to. I- incredible. And, and I, I, I didn't write down everything, but they, he, Donald Sutherland says... The highest achievement in filmmaking will be awarded to one of these motion pictures. And then he goes through the five best picture nominees at the time in this year, which were uh, Ron Howard's Beautiful Mind. And he says Ron Howard, uh, Robert Altman's Gosford Park. And he says Robert Altman, uh, Lord, Lord of the Rings, The Fellowship of the Ring, Peter Jackson. He says Peter Jackson, Baz Luhrmann's Moulin Rouge and In the Bedroom. Doesn't mention Todd no, no, Field. Todd Field. Nothing Just for fuck Todd you, Field. Todd Field. You do not exist. <laughs> you did not direct this movie. I'm sorry to tell you. Not even mentioned. A complete hi hat. Like, who, who are you? Oh, you used to be an actor. <laughs> he doesn't even get. I don't even think he's on camera when they show it. He's like hide. He's he's framed behind like the actors. You don't even see him. Unbelievable. <laughs> the disrespect for Todd Field. In, incredibly rude. So, um. My, I mean, my favorite thing, obviously, you know, everyone's seen Halle Berry's speech a billion times. So my favorite announcing moment from this year is when Glenn Close stumbles over Emmy. She says it three different times. Enemy, en- enemy, enemy. enemy, yeah. Oh, it's so, it's, I feel so, you could hear her being so upset about it. This is like amazing. <laughs> another great, another great intro here line from the announcers. I think it's Donald Sutherland as well. Or maybe it was Glenn. Uh, the new century's the new century's brightest new stars, Joyce, Josh Hartnett, Jennifer Lopez, Tobey Maguire, Cameron Diaz, and Hugh Jackman. Now, Jennifer Lopez has been on a million Oscars. She's presenting again on this show. 
but the best is um glenn later intros j-lo and she calls her um the film and recording star yes Jennifer lopez yeah. yeah uh no offense to josh harden who's like kind of had a rebound here not on the same level still as jennifer lopez toby mcguire cameron diaz and new jackman all of whom are absolutely incredibly famous at this very moment um i mean well that was like what pearl harbor was supposed to do yes so and 40 days and 40 nights was that this year or the next year i feel like was it, it just was next year it was yeah. uh so that was probably out around this time because the oscars were held on a sunday march 24th 2002 and i feel like 40 days and 40 nights was definitely a spring or yeah or it came out it came out in early march yes. i think yeah uh, so then, like you said, Cruz opens it up, not Whoopi Goldberg, who's hosting for the fourth time. They this is why out- the show is four and a half hours, because they just brought everyone here. <laughs> so, you know, Robert Redford gets his honorary Oscar later. Robert Redford gets an honorary Oscar, speaks for 10 minutes. Sidney Poitier gets an honorary Oscar, speaks yeah. for 10 minutes. Arthur Hiller gets a humanitarian award, speaks for 10 minutes. Yeah, so you get Woody minutes. Allen, open with Tom, who's going <laughs> to play a short film from Errol Morris. <laughs> it's so much, but it's so good. It was so good. I loved watching this one. Tom Cruise, I wrote down what he wrote. He, he talks about how uh it, he he was like it's just it's the most ridiculous speech tom cruise performing it is great he talks about the movies it's like the movies vin diesel mean basically but before vin diesel did it tom cruise says is it important is it even he talked to one of his actor friends after 9 11 is it important is it even important what i do what about a night like tonight should we celebrate the joy and magic movies bring well dare i say now more than ever so inspirational a small scene a gesture even a glance between two characters can cross lines break through barriers melt prejudice just plain make us laugh a little bit of magic but that's just me what do movies mean to you pull up a sofa it's just us talking it's oscar night whoever wrote that million stars i know uh, i was gonna say who are the writers this year even know. is it bruce valanche <laughs> is it is it paul thomas anderson because when i read and i hear uh that's just me I think of Philip Baker Hall in uh, Boogie Nights talking about like his weird sexual proclivities. I also was laughing at movies now more than ever, ever, which is in the player directed by Robert Allman, who is in the audience, but said here completely straight face without any cynicism. Just a remarkable time. He he didn't know. He, he had no idea. Tom has never seen it. No, they just, uh, they gave him the speech like an hour beforehand. So he, he flew in on his chopper. You know, they you don't know. even open with Whoopi. The next thing is the Errol Morris doc. We still haven't seen Whoopi. It is now 10 minutes into the show and we're doing another five minute bit. Because she had to get to the ceiling. Okay. <laughs> so Errol Morris asked people like what their favorite movies are basically, I think, or kind of like that's the. Yeah, I'm not going to lie. When I rewatch this, I skip that. I watched it because I wanted to see. Here's, uh, here's Donald Trump seeing his favorite movie moment seeing King Kong try and conquer New York. No shit. Like holy cow! What an appropriate, uh, what appropriate thing for Donald Trump to pick. Uh, TB12 says Braveheart. I've seen it 150 times. Tracks, tracks, totally tracks. He should talk to Trump about King Kong. Do you think they text about King Kong and Braveheart still? Absolutely, yeah. I and mean, then, what, like you know, he's retired now. What what else does he have to do? And then Laura Bush. I don't even. I think she picks Giant. She talks about Al Sharpton. I don't even remember what he picked. And Mikhail uh, Gorbachev is in this. Because if you're thinking of 9-11 and just, I don't even know, Perestroika, I guess, they're just like, throw Gorbachev, man, it's great. We need to make it international, you know, so. Uh, New York was a big part of the show. It seemed like they were live simulcasting in Times Square so people could watch. And then you got to bring in Woody later, when we through the show. Before we do that, Whoopi gets lower down from the ceiling, like Moulin Rouge. Yes. Uh, I am the original sexy beast, is her intro line. A great laugh line, because sexy beast was a nominee this year. And then she makes a Eliza Minnelli joke. Which I wrote down. This is like Liza's wedding. I don't barely even ref, understand the reference. Not I'm like, have to, I don't understand the reference. Captain she Because she was about to, or I think she had married David Guest at this okay. point. Uh, so. They cut to Sharon Stone, who is uproariously laughing. Like it's the a, funniest thing she ever said. A lot of over the top reactions from the audience. Because the next cut is to Julie Roberts, who is over laughing. Sharon Stone's over laughing. <laughs> Gaffing. Never seen Julia Roberts laugh like that in my entire life. Julia had a great night because, as we know later, her she gets to present the Oscar to her BFF Denzel. Yes, so. Pelican Brief co-star Denzel wins his Oscar. Yeah. Uh, Mariah, uh, Mariah, 
I, I killed the punchline for Whoopi. Whoopi says we have recovered from 9-11. Mariah Carey has already made another movie. <laughs> I know, kind of cringe, but... Mm, mm. <laughs> Terrible, yeah. but like kind of funny. Security is tighter than some of the faces is another Whoopi line. And then she's priming the pump for how long it's going to be. No shit, because it's literally 40 minutes into the show and she's still doing a monologue. The show is going to be long, but not as long as it takes to explain Mulholland Drive, which I'm sure your friends at the sleepover would agree with. Yeah, I don't think they ever even tried to finish the movie. Like we just woke up the next morning and was like, let's eat. So um, I my favorite joke um, that I have always remembered um was like oh they seated the smith family together and it's will and jada and maggie smith yes when she back when she still attended award ceremonies <laughs> really great she seemed like she was having a blast the gosford yeah, yeah. Park team was there they were loving it mm-hmm. uh the first i i think the first award of the night was oh like, wait, wait but um what I they're the the monsters inc joke right well was that's that her no, that was Nathan. Oh Lane no, that later. was later. Okay, there's a great Harvey joke <laughs> later. No, it's fine. We could. Do, I mean, we could do it now. It's later. We let's save it because we have a lot of Harvey stuff later. I think in this, uh, there's a lot of Harvey stuff in general. Un- unfortunately, um, so the the Benicio comes out to present Best Supporting Actress. That's how we 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 start off with the bang, and the winner is Jennifer Connelly for a, a beautiful mind choice. Yeah, um, one so beautiful mind and Lord of the Rings win four awards yes night. so they top the night and then black hawk down and moulin rouge won two so not not a lot of spread the wealth here no and the nominees so lord of the rings had 13 nominations one acting nomination for amy kellen beautiful mind moulin rouge with eight gosford park with seven amelie in the bedroom with five black hawk down monsters inc pearl harbor four harry potter iris with three ai ali memento monsters ball shrek and training day with two yeah um you know, not surprising that Lord of the Rings got the most. No. So. I, I didn't, you know what the funny thing is rewatching, I didn't remember it being like that much of a juggernaut where it was going to get that many nominations. Because I just, for whatever reason, I just was like, oh, they weren't really hip to it until like the last one. But they were on this one, obviously. The second one. I mean, one the last was the one was just them um, like giving it everything for the win. The second one, yeah, like Peter was snubbed for the second one in director. Yeah, but no, it was, it was, uh, you know, I, I remember in before the film was released, it was just like, well, this flop, basically, you know, right. um, and it didn't. Um, and yeah, it, it had a, a good run, like awards run, I guess. So, but I I guess I would say it probably finished runner up to A Beautiful Mind. Best, I guess we could do Best Picture. Let's do Best Picture. So we'll, we'll start there and go back. So Best Picture, like you said, Beautiful Mind, Gosford Park, In the Bedroom, Lord of the Rings, and Moulin Rouge. Uh, not the strongest list, I would argue. Um, it's fine. <laughs> I think if it wasn't going to be a beautiful mind, it would have definitely been Lord of the Rings to win here. Yeah, I. Mm, and I yeah, think I, would, I would say, and then third, I I don't probably Gosford Park just because. Robert Allman got the director nomination and Boz didn't. Yes. I, I think that's true. And I think if it was now with the the current Academy, there is actually no way Beautiful Mind would have won. I think Lord of the Rings probably would have won or or Gosford Park. Uh, of this lineup. Yes. He, yeah, I, I mean, I guess it depends on how the season also unfolded. Because are you are you saying that like a beautiful mind did not win everything in the lead up? Because it did. <laughs> no, I just think that like it would have the the dirty tricks campaign against beautiful mind maybe would have yeah. had more staying power. It's hard to talk about this without thinking of that, right? Yeah. Like, so uh, I guess yeah, there was a uh, if no one remembers, there was a humongous smear campaign against a beautiful mind. Yes. This year. A lot uh, of dirty it, tactics. It, there's a New York Times article from March 16th. A beautiful mind meets ugly Oscar tactics, and the lead is this. John Nash, who's the character Russell Crowe played, who's a real was was a yeah. Real they were movie. accused of um, whitewashing his story and like all these changes. And uh, I think it started on the Drudge Report. Yes, yeah. it was a great time for the internet, Joyce. Mm-hmm. A, a lot of a lot of these old stories, uh, a lot of references to internet back when the style was to still capitalize internet. Yes. I capitalize. Uh, here's the New York Times story by Rick Lyman on March 16, two thousand two. John Nash says he is not an anti-Semite. Great when you got a when that's the lead. Yeah. 
Wow, that's a tough beat. That's, uh, that's when he's going on like 60 minutes or something. Yeah, that's the lead of the story. He says he is not a homosexual, nor he says that he tried to conceal any of his deficiencies as a fa- father or any humiliating episodes in attempt to glamorize his life. Uh, to combat those rumors, Mr. Nash, a Nobel laureate whose triumph over schizophrenia is chronicled in the Oscar nominated film, A Beautiful Mind, feels obligated to go on national television. He will appear on Sunday's 60 Minutes. Some in the film industry say he is actually the victim of a whisper campaign whose aim is to scuttle the movie's Oscar hopes, a phenomenon they say has become increasingly common in the intense competition for the Academy Awards. And here's a quote from someone you might know. This may not be the worst year in Oscar history, but it's pretty low, said Pete Hammond, a film historian and consultant for American movie classics. To accuse the subject of a film being anti-Semitic when you know that a lot of people who will be voting on Oscars are Jewish, well, that's really down and dirty. Pete now obviously a great Oscar expert at deadline choice. Mm-hmm. So th- th- um, that 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 that's that's where we're going with here. Yeah. So the same day, March sixteenth, two thousand two, of that L- uh, New York Times story, the L.A. Times also ran a story about this headline: "Oscar fever is pushing the envelope of civility." So about you know smear campaign, all this stuff, and um, there's there's a quote from Terry Press. Yeah. Who was uh she she, like they it was the dreamworks marketing chief um and dreamworks did the foreign rights to a beautiful mind but domestically it was universal so quote it's no longer a whisper campaign it's more of a yelling campaign i feel like every day we all need to take a shower and i don't want to feel that way so then like blah 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 all this stuff um and then uh oh so here Jeffrey Gottsick, vice president of domestic marketing for Fox, said the responsibility is shared by the internet, capital I, the media that cover the entertainment and the dozens of groups that give out awards. Quote, the reality is that for anything to change, it's going to have to be self-police, Gottsick said. Maybe that is the evolution that will come out of this year. Maybe people will learn from this. Um, And then stuff more about... A Beautiful Mind, and then the the controversy over the hurricane, same thing, you know, got killed by uh, allegations of inaccuracies. And where's the quote I want? Um, okay, so uh, Miramax had in the bedroom. Yes. Right. That was Harvey's big movie that year. Yeah. Uh, so here we go. Uh, Miramax denied being a uh, Part of this mirror campaign that, that, that was their party line so miramax co-chairman harvey weinstein whose studio has often been at the heart of cutthroat oscar competition tried to distance himself from the fray by knocking on a beautiful mind star russell crowe's hotel door in los angeles after the oscar luncheon and showing him his academy ballot saying he would vote for howard <laughs> for best director <laughs> Parenthetical, of course, Miramax does not have a competitor in this category because Todd Field was snubbed. <laughs> Amazing. So, just uh, tremendous stuff here. A uh, couple of things here in that same Times article. Um, when the Los Angeles Times reported that a representative for Miramax had called to direct one of its reporters to the Drudge Report report. Miramax reassigned the representative and Oscar strategist to other duties. Harvey Weinstein, co-chair of the company, then called an executive at Universal to apologize. Uh, and in, in the Oscar War book, Joyce, which we both have, I was just oh, yeah. coming through Oscar it here. It came out. There was a funny February. part. Uh, this is this is another one. Uh, whatever Weinstein's part, his mere presence pushed the boundaries. Other competitors had protective cover. Somebody connected to a beautiful mindset. If he was in the race, you could behave badly knowing that he would be the first one people would suspect anyway. And there was like a note in here that like even like someone from the Lord of the Rings team later apologized to Universal for like, you know, maybe participating in this dirty tricks campaign to get uh, the smear of of John Nash uh, and remove Beautiful Mind from the board. Yeah, well, the, the other part of that too was also the spending. I think spending went up 20% yes. to campaign spending. We could also tie this back to this year with uh, Andrea Riseboro. Yes. You know, they, they had no no money for that campaign to Leslie. So, um, and then there's like, yeah, yeah. In this story, there's a lot of venting about, you know, certain studios not having the money. Um, 
and then you know that's all mixed up with uh the smear campaign so so this is this story ends with a quote from oh so it says okay this year's campaign has been a source of irritation for longtime members of the academy such as publicist johnny freakin his anger over the amount of money spent on advertising and negative campaigning has been building in recent years he said quote i'm very depressed said freakin a member of the academy for 30 years Quote, there is enough smog in the air without all the nonsense that is being thrown out there. But I don't think it matters. I think it's the picture and the performance that win in the end. Part of the game is to get them to watch the cassette. Amazing. And then he said, paraphrasing former Clint aide James Carville, it's the picture, stupid. Oh, that's nice. I like that. Yeah. Nice. I, I, got one last thing. I got one last thing to read here about this, and then we can talk about what we would pick, I guess, for best picture that year, in addition, the other nominees. But here's some Oscars again. This is Michael uh, Michael Schulman's book, yeah, right? Yeah, highly recommend. Great book. Really, 500 really pages. Great. Did you actually read all 500 pages? Get out of here. You I, know, you're I read this first and I got through like, this. This is never finishing this book. No, but I will, I'll be using it though because I love, I love using it for research. Uh, but this is a great graph. At the 2002 Golden Globes, Weinstein heard that Nikki Fink, RIP, was about to publish a column blaming him for the Beautiful Mind Smear campaign. Convinced this was the doing of Terry Press, who lived rent-free in his head, he marched into the CAA after party and found Universal Stacy Snyder, all of five foot two. You're going down for this, he screamed, jabbing a thick finger in her face. The partygoers watched the tirade in shock. You fat fuck, Pierre Press shrieked. Get away from her. Uh, so seemingly, what could do here, actually, the joke that you were referencing, Joyce, later in the show, Nathan Lane comes out to uh, announce Monsters, Inc. as, oh, I'm sorry, sorry, Shrek uh, as the I just blew the joke again. With this fucking Nathan Lane joke, we killed. But uh, he, he does best animated feature for, for the first time. This is the first year uh, they do best animated feature. And uh, let's see if I can find the joke. Monsters. Up until now, this is Nathan Lane. I thought Monsters, Inc. was a documentary on the Weinsteins. But Groans. Uh -huh. And one of the most true jokes in the history of fucking Earth, Nathan Lane, 23 years, 20 years before that was uh, shown to be incredibly true. But, uh, wow. So that was that was the Oscars choice. So that, that was, was, that, was, that, was the, that was the smear campaign. Whoopi and, references it yeah. in the monologue. I think she says, because it was, again, a night of obviously like a lot of uh, black nominees, which is a rarity for the Oscars. And obviously we get like the historic Halle Berry win here and Denzel winning and Sidney Poitier. And she says uh, all the nominees are black as all the mud that was being slung or slung around, I believe. I'm, I'm paraphrasing the joke, but that was kind of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then uh, we'll get to it later with the acting categories, but a lot of just uh, after the ceremony patting on their backs. Of. Yeah, big time. That De definitely felt like a lot to this year, kind of, especially with like the, the Michelle yeah. Yeoh stuff. It reminded me of that reading about Halle Berry and especially in the in the, the Oscar Wars book. Mm -hmm. So the best picture. So like we said, those are the five nominees. I would have gone with this list. I would have gone Lord of the Rings personally. Same. Uh, I came up with the, the extra movies that I would have nominated based on like what the nominees were at the time. This is what I got. Tell me how wrong this is. It's not a great list. I'm just going to tell you right now. I have Amelie. Uh, I, I, yeah, I can see it. I, I wrote that down too. Okay. I have Black Hawk Down. Because I got into directing. Yes. I have Shrek. Same. I have Training Day. And I have Iris. Those are the, those are the additional five. Iris. Interesting. Um, I, I, I don't think it would have gotten in, but I wrote Demo Holland Drive. But the, it, it only got one nomination for directing. For so I, I had Mulholland Drive in like the back half of my second tier. I don't think it would have gotten in either. Yeah. And then I wrote down um, In the Mood for Love, which I feel like would be something that would get in now. Yes. In a field of 10. So sort of like Amelie too. Um, I also wrote down Memento. I don't think it would have gotten in, but it's like, I, it's it's something that like maybe could have gone in now it would have been in the mix now yes um and then i just i wrote down the man who wasn't there who i don't think uh or like which i didn't think was close that year but it was like an, an, another cohen's joint i i also i thought monster's ball was my last one between iris and monster's ball i went iris i could be convinced of monster's ball but I don't, i'm not sure if people it, lionsgate didn't really they kind of really focused just on hallie so yeah. i feel like 
that's probably was a demerit. But I think if it was now, it probably would have gotten in because I think it could have made it in on the 10. Mm -hmm. I don't Um, know. And then I just, I just wrote down Harry Potter. I don't think it would have gotten in at all, but it was just another blockbuster. I put Ocean's Eleven down and Tenenbaums as possibilities, but yeah, I, I have those two. I don't think like I don't think any of them would have been closed. It is kind of interesting that this year launched two major franchises, the Lord of the Rings and Harry Potter, a month apart. So. Pretty wild. That would ne- would that happen now? I guess probably would. Everything is franchises. I mean, but yeah, everything is IP. So um, we have a Harry Potter series. We have, we already have a Lord of the Rings series. So. Uh, <laughs> For for best director uh, that year, Ron Howard won for Beautiful Mind. Gives a great speech. I really loved his speech. Uh, I don't nice think speech. this is a really good Ron Howard movie. Personally, I could think of like five or six others that I like more. Uh, no. Well, finish reading the nominees first. <laughs> the other nominees were Ridley Scott for Black Hawk Down, Robert Altman for Gosford Park, Peter Jackson for Lord of the Rings, and David Lynch for Mulholland Drive. Yeah. So, I I feel like this is very much a classic case of like a makeup win because as we know he was snubbed for apollo 13 yes and it made me laugh because guess who gives him the oscar oh huh who mel gibson who would not be invited back now (laughs) would definitely not be invited back but he arguably took ron howard's oscar right for uh, for braveheart and and apollo 13 and uh here he is giving giving ronnie an oscar yeah, and I think, um, you know, that's like they're the branch is adventurous with the nominations, but then everyone votes for the winner. And obviously, A Beautiful Mind was going to win Best Picture. And this was also back when, you know, we, we saw the field of five in picture. So directing and picture were more linked. Yeah. And yeah, I probably would rank him last here of <laughs> this group. <laughs> I have nothing. I like. I legitimately do like Ron Howard. Like, yeah, I'm looking for, I like it. Like, it's, it's to- the movie's totally fine. Like, the movie's I, totally fine. But it's like, I mean, like of the movies he's made. Like, I'll just. I'm looking at his like filmography here. I'll just go through some of the ones I think are better: Splash, Cocoon, Gung Ho, Willow, Parenthood, Backdraft, <laughs> The Paper, Apollo 13, Ransom, uh, Cinderella Man, even Frost Nixon. Like, all of these are better movies. Rush. Uh, I just like not that much of a fan of Beautiful Mind. But I'm not upset that he won an Oscar though. So no, but it it definitely it like yeah, I remember thinking that at the time too. Like it was just the way the movie was already front running, you know, and it's just kind of like the the serious biopic stuff, and it's like broad appealing. You could like sit anyone down and they can watch it, and it's fine. Like not everyone's gonna be into Lord of the Rings and genre, you know. I think that that was also a demerit for Lord of the Rings. Like they're probably were not as open minded to genre stuff winning, and also that like you know again the year before it was Gladiator, so maybe they feel like we can't go back to back with like a huge ass blockbuster. Right. I I think if I was like I said I would have given this to Lord of the Rings and probably Peter Jackson, even though like I'm not really nuts well, about Peter any, won. Um, he won. All right, he won for he he won yeah. the BAFTA for right. so like BAFTA back when BAFTA could still like you know make up their own minds about things <laughs> uh BAFTA gave Lord of the Rings picture and director yes so. uh, uh not a bad not a bad pick there I would say um yeah so the two so this directing and picture did not line up obviously so we're missing Bos Lerman and Todd Field as we said <laughs> and both of whom I would have absolutely put in here and then we were kind of like you know this past year is like oh will they get in this year and obviously Todd did for Tar but right. Boss did not. So I I found a uh, New York Post story after nominations. Yeah. What do you got? So their headline is Boz Steel Day for us for Oscars. Snub of Rouge director is biggest shock among nods. So they talked to like all the nominees and uh, the lead is just where's Boz? Um, so th- this is a quote from Peter Jackson. I was very surprised he got shut out. Uh, there are always unexpected things, but it's a shame. It's just too bad. And then they also talked to Boz, who said he was, quote, a little disappointed. I would have loved to have been on the list, he told the Post. So if I remember correctly, and like I said, not as focused on the Oscars in 2002, as I mean, as I am now, 
But I will say the the surprise of that group was less so David Lynch and more even Ridley Scott because Black Hawk Down was such a late entry. It felt yeah. like that was like kind of he kind of clinted it. He just dove in there in the last last hour and like pulled out a nomination or maybe Clint is Ridley Scotting it in those later years. And then, you know, years later, it'll they'll snub him for the Martian. So. Right. Um, it did feel like I, I, I like, guess like maybe like is it like any like afterglow from Gladiator 2? I, I don't know. I kind of think so. And I think that if, I mean, like, again, who knows, but I just feel like Black Hawk Down, if it had come out like a month or two earlier, maybe would have had a well, lot Well, yeah, Ridley issues. also got DGA, too. Yeah. So, so DGA was, here, DJ was Ron, who won, Peter Oz, who made DGA, Christopher Nolan from Memento, and Ridley. Right. Uh, Yeah, I'm, I'm also not surprised David Lynch got in because of the branch, right? Like, yeah. that just seems like kind of, kind of right. Um. um I, so I so I wrote down I think like uh Wong Kar Wai for in a mood of love uh in a mood for love sure would be like a contender now. I thought Wes Anderson for sure would have been a contender now. I also wrote down Steven Soderbergh for Ocean's Eleven. Uh, and Mark Forster I wrote down as well for Monsters Ball. Uh, the other people I wrote down obviously Nolan Richard Kelly for Donnie Darko. I don't think it would have gotten in, but like I think that's like the auteur thing that you could see now. Maybe people being like, it's definitely a directorial achievement. He's certainly at least in the same league as David Lynch for Mulholland Drive. I don't think those two movies are that far apart. I mean, personally, like so. Um, yeah. So I don't know. Congratulations to Ron Howard. I yeah, I, there's not a lot to say here. I just feel like. It's kind of hard even to get worked up about it because Peter Jackson wins for Return of the King in a few years. So it's like nobody here is like really egregiously missing out. I do think Todd Field should have gotten nominated, but he gets nominated for Tar, like we said. And Baz should have gotten nominated too, probably. But, you know, maybe next time. Yeah, well, I guess it's just like, you know, there are people here who ha have not won. So, right. Um, I'm also glad that like Ron Howard won, I guess. I don't know. Um. Let's do the supporting categories for the lead because they're more fun, the lead ones. Supporting, we mentioned Jennifer Connelly wins Best Supporting Actress uh, for Beautiful Mind. A totally anodyne speech. I thought very nice. She's reading it off a piece of paper. The other nominees are Helen Mirren and Maggie Smith for Gosford Park, Marissa Tomei for In the Bedroom, and Kate Winslet for Iris. Yeah, this was one of those like... Um like just like preordained wins that we have a lot of the times it's like we just like some someone like a pundit somewhere the you know the film twitter before film twitter existed decided that jennifer connelly was the front runner for best supporting actress for a beautiful yep. mind and then like everyone was like mm. yeah we're fine with that no cool. it yeah 100 percent. and we've seen this kind of win a million times since and this kind of actor uh, making, making yeah, and like you know, it's also like she she's a veteran because she's a child star, right. you know. So it was not even like it's like it's like her first film or anything either. Although like that, this category is also very palatable to those too. If it's like your film debut, they um, mentioned she, that in her in, as she's walking up. I think Glenn Close is like, or maybe Southern again. It could only be the two of them, but it's one of them is like uh, she made her film debut in Sergio Leone's uh, Once Upon a Time in the West or whatever, right? So like at age eleven, yeah, and then she was. She won everything except SAG because they submitted her in lead in SAG. Mm -hmm. So she was nominated in lead at SAG and she lost that. And then at in, in SAG, Helen, uh, Helen Mirren won for Gosford Park. But so like that lineup is hilarious because she's the only one, Helen, who got an Oscar nomination. <laughs> the other four did not. It was Kate Blanchett for Bandits, uh, Judy Dench for The Shipping News, Cameron Diaz, you know. Vanilla Sky and Dakota Fanning for I Am Sam, seven years old. Didn't mention I Am Sam. Uh, similar to the score, another movie that would not exist in 2023. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah. I, I had for, <laughs> I had a lot of great options here for people who could have gotten nominated, include leading off with Cameron Diaz and Vanilla Sky, who's completely unhinged and amazingly good, and that movie is underrated, I think, and like. Uh, really solid yeah i mean we've we've talked about her before how you know she came so close twice yeah and yeah uh other people i wrote down i don't have a lot of faith these would ever happen but scarlett johansson in ghost world is one of my favorite performances right. for her yeah, she's same. so funny uh incredibly droll i love her carrie moss in memento is solid but not the type of performance that really would get nominated i feel like but i think if the movie would have taken off you could argue she could laura herring for mulholland drive 
Um, pretty good. Gwyneth Paltrow and Angelica Houston for Tenenbaums. Either of them, I, I have them to too. See. Yeah. And then introducing Julia Roberts for Ocean's Eleven, Joyce. Introducing one of my favorite credits of all time. Yes. Um, remember when they initially ran Naomi Watts in supporting? Yes. For McCall and Drive, yeah. We'll mention Naomi Watts, obviously, too. I think she could have gotten in for a lead, obviously. Um, yeah, I didn't really have a lot of people for supporting actors either, just like the people you listed. Um, would you have done Kate Blanchett for Bandits in supporting or lead? She got the nomination lead at the Globes, but th- that's also because they have comedy. I kind of feel like, yes, lead. I don't know. I don't, I think... Yeah, I was thinking about that. I was like, I don't know where I would actually put her. I, I haven't seen that movie in a while. She's but I don't think fun. she would have gotten nominated, right? Do you at all? No, it, it's just so like she, they submitted her in supporting in, in SAG. So, um, but, but yeah, um, yeah, I have no issues with Jennifer's win. Thought she was solid in the film. Just like, you know, the classic you know suffering wife <laughs> yeah it's just a classic oscar performance classic oscar actress like all of this feels like very chalk did it at the beginning of the show nobody cares move on right basically no it's a great win i, I love jennifer Connolly, great but like just like move it on yeah and then you know you got helen and maggie being the gosford park reps you know i love you know i love the members of tomei nom you know she made it back that um, felt like a real like vindication for her win exactly yeah you know yeah um and she she made it back uh seven years later for the wrestler too uh supporting actor came later in the show jim broadbent wins for iris uh and he it wins for iris but it's also for moulin rouge and he gives a big shout out to boz in the speech for moulin rouge this is really funny uh this i think category is real snoozer uh other nominees are ethan hawk for training day who i love in, in training day he's definitely a co-lead but sure uh ben kingsley for sexy beast ian mckellen for lord of the rings and john voight for Ali as Howard Cosell. Yeah. Um it was like I the think... peak of Void, I feel like at the time. Kind of like you, we... you mean not Ray Donovan? <laughs> no. But I feel like this is when he had come back. Like varsity blues and shit. He'd been back. Yes. Like here we go. Um I think Ethan has more screen time than Denzel. Yeah. He's the lead, yeah. honestly. Yeah, he's the lead. But obviously they're gonna fraud him in supporting. Yeah, sure. Um yeah, I I think you know jim totally fine in iris and moulin rouge um he won the bafta for moulin rouge yes um so you know again this was back when bafta had inspired nominees so their other nominees were colin firth for bridget jones's diary great performance had him written down yeah sure eddie murphy for shrek had him written down too yes same um hugh bonneville for iris fine sure and Robbie Coltrane for Harry Potter. Pretty good. Uh, there's yeah. The reason I'm like such a snooze R. on this R. category R. is because, man, there's so many better people they could have put in, frankly. Including yeah, so, most of the people we just mentioned. Uh, well, my number one for this is my guy, Paul Bettany for A Knight's Tale. Absolutely iconic performance. The best hype man of all time. Just banger after banger of lines. I want him to intro me in... For every room I walk in, even though I want no attention on me, but just an incredible performance. Um, and I think it's also, I mean, obviously that movie was definitely not the Academy's cup of tea, but it's also a comedic performance too. So it's like, they're definitely not paying attention, but just a breakout turn for him. And he was obviously also in A Beautiful Mind where he met Jennifer Connelly and they're still married. So love them. Uh, uh, but yeah, I would have nominated him and given him the win. <laughs> My number one was Joe Pantoliano for Memento. Kind of can't believe he didn't get nominated. Yeah. Like it feels like such an easy, like classic villain kind of performance that would get nominated. If that was Joe Pesci in that role, he would have won probably. You know what I mean? Like if it's just a different actor. I feel like if that movie were made by like someone a little bit more established, they would have gone for more. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the other people I wrote down, I did meant, uh, Colin Firth, I thought, and Eddie Murphy. Eddie Murphy really should have gotten nominated. I know that we're not going to nominate voice performances, but like. They should. They should, and he's amazing. Uh, Vince Vaughn for Made, which I know is your favorite movie. It's a, it's a, that's a good performance. Steve Buscemi for Ghost World, I think, is a phenomenal performance. He won a couple of critics awards. Uh, ben Stiller for Royal Tenenbaums, love him in Royal Tenenbaums. I think that's one of his best performances. Brad Pitt for Ocean's Eleven, just a classic Brad Pitt movie. Style I have, performance. I have Carl Reiner for Ocean's Eleven. Great. Love, I'm Lyman Zerga. Uh, amazing. He's too tall for him. 
And then even Gandolfini for Mexican, even though that movie's not very good. But I thought like it was he was like good. Like that would have been like an Alec Baldwin for the cooler nomination, I feel like, if he got nominated. Um, kind of a forgotten nomination, not by me though. The cooler. Yeah. Um, I also wrote down Christopher Maloney for Wet Hot American Summer. Would have been great. Oh my god, so good. Legendary. So uh, yeah. So that gets us to the actors. Now we'll get to the real fun stuff, the lead actor performances and actress performances. Uh, so who we should do first? actor first. Let's do actor first. Okay. So, uh, not Julie Roberts comes out. She had won for Aaron Brockovich the year before and the nominees were, uh, hold on. I lost, I lost my track already. Denzel for training day, Russell Crowe for beautiful mind, Sean Penn for I am Sam, the, the Will Smith for Ali and Tom Wilkinson for in the bedroom. So really only down between Denzel and Russell Crowe, uh, Russell Crowe won at the BAFTAs, I believe, right? Um, Russell Crowe won everywhere. So he <laughs> won the Globe yes. drama. Yes. Um, Gene Hackman, who should have been nominated, uh, won Comedy Globe yes. for Royal Ten Moms. Um, he Russell won Critics' Choice, SAG, and the BAFTA, uh, during which an incident occurred. Yes. You have this article pulled up, Joyce. I do. So as uh, many people know, um, BAFTAs are not live. Uh, they're on tape delay. So he read a poem in his speech. And on the broadcast version, they edited out the poem. And he got mad. And he assaulted a producer. So this article is from the BBC, uh, February 28th, 2002. Headline, Crow Defends BAFTA Outburst. Um, he, okay, so it's Hollywood star Russell Crowe has defended his verbal attack on a TV executive after his acceptance speech at the BAFTA Awards was cut from the broadcast of the ceremony. He told U.S. TV show Entertainment Tonight on Wednesday that he had nothing to apologize for. However, the actor admitted he may have been more, quote, passionate than less necessary on learning his speech had been edited down for the BBC One broadcast. Um, uh, Crow was said to have confronted Malcolm Jerry, whose company Initial Productions made the program for the BBC because his quote from Kavanaugh's poem, Sanctity, had been disproved, oh, had been dropped, sorry. Crow uh, told uh, E.T., quote, if you know anything about me, you know I'm going to stand up for myself if I believe I've been wrong. Speaking of Mr. Jerry, the actor said, quote, he's not battered, he's not bruised, and he's not bloodied. His ears will be ringing, though. I have no regrets about what I said to him. But he added, quote, what I said to him may have been a little bit more passionate than now in the cold light of day. I would have liked it to have been. Wow. So and then so then at the time, there was talk like, will will this or will this not hurt him? And he had also obviously won the year before for Gladiator. And ironically, that year, the only thing he won before the Oscars was Critics' Choice. <laughs> so this year, he won everything in the lead up. And this may or may not have been an issue. Who knows? But he did not win the Oscar. I kind of like, I'm trying to remember why I felt like he wasn't going to win. And then I guess I'm just like, I think people just like, it, it feels like that could have definitely played a part in it. And maybe like a little Russell Crowe fatigue, certainly after like Gladiator having won. And I just feel like people just like Den Denzel more and like, like the performance more, right? Like it was more in intoxicating of a performance playing a villain like that. It was also, well, I mean, we, we talked about this last year when we did, um, you know, the 92 films, like Son of a Woman and just like the butterfly effect of the makeup win for Al Pacino instead of giving it to Denzel from Malcolm X. And then like, would like would Denzel have won here um, or not? Or, and then I think the other factor was there was just a lot of coverage and, you know, conversation at that time after nominations about three lead uh, bl black nominees in the lead categories. That was just a lot, a lot of ink spilled. Yes. About and, that. And honorary Oscar for uh Sidney Poitier, who yeah. obviously Denzel intros, they bring him out to like intro it. Um, and then Denzel wins. 
And I don't know. I mean, Russell Crowe is like pretty gracious, it seemed like, and, and a former co-star, Virtuosity Faves and future American gangster stars. So I'm sure they get along, the two of them. I don't think Russell cares. <laughs> I don't think so either. Um, and Denzel has a great line. It's like, I'm always going to be chasing you, Sydney, basically the same night, like that kind of thing. Great, great moment. A great Oscar speech, I feel like. Um, um, and like also like Julia, you know, his BFF campaigning heavily for him. Like she made you know, no secret of who she wanted to win and who she was voting for. Yeah. So uh, I love I mean, it's a great performance. And like villains are great, I think, a lot of times. And like when you play like a big over the top villain, uh, it just felt like you know kind of like yeah and then it was it was like you know people wanted him to have a lead oscar because he just had one right. for supporting for glory so it felt like a good time as well to i guess to give him another one i think it was just a lot of things lining up for him yeah. but yeah he didn't he didn't win any precursors or like the, the major ones I, I don't think he won anything at all i'm actually not surprised he didn't win because i'm like i feel like baftas would have never obviously baftas history with, well like, they've never nominated is, him is so. zero the the BAFTA <laughs> oh. the BAFTA lineup was Russell, Ian McKellen. They they put in lead for Gandalf. I I, I do wish Ian McKellen had won an Oscar for Gandalf, um, and Jim Broadbent for Iris. So they put him in there too. Kevin Spacey, remember him for, for K Pax for the shipping news, Ugh. and Tom Wilkinson, obviously. So I mean, Gene Hack. I I would have loved. Denzel, I'm happy he won. And like, it's a classic Denzel performance, like an iconic Denzel line and everything. Gene Hackman in Royal Tenenbaums is absolutely my favorite. Uh, just a remarkably good performance. I'm surprised. I, I wish he would have gotten nominated. Um, yeah, especially knowing, you know, he was going to retire in yeah. a year. Um, right. And he's also someone who like could have been supporting too, but I'm fine with him in lead. Yeah, if he was supporting, I think he would have won. Yeah. Uh, I th- it would have been a huge fraud, but it would have won. Uh, and then people- three Oscars, so. Yeah. Other people I wrote down, Billy Bob Thornton for Monsters mm-hmm. Ball or Bandits, I guess, right? Like, Or any- The Man Who Wasn't There. Any of those. Uh, Tom Cruise for Van- Vanilla Sky. I love this Tom Cruise performance. I- the thing I love about, you'll ne- we'll never see Tom Cruise do this kind of stuff again, like acting. He has, he has no interest in it. So. He has no interest in it. So it's like, this is like, it's sad that he'll- he will never win an Oscar like for acting when he had these like really interesting roles like Magnolia and this. And I just, I really like this Vanilla Scott performance. Uh, Ewan McGregor from Moulin Rouge. Obviously, I don't think he would have gotten in, but like, seemed like he could have. Yeah, got- great performance. Um, Guy Pierce from Memento. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and I wrote down Ben Stiller for Zoolander. Classic comedy. Of course performance. you did. Um, but yeah, so this, yeah, um, it was, it was also Will Smith's first nomination. Yes. Uh, yeah. He looks so young in the clips of it, Joyce. I was like shocked. Um. He, he was, was so in young. his early 30s so yeah he was he was 33 so uh i'm just four. looking here i'm looking up for our next thing was uh was halle berry winning for best actress there's a whole big oh, yeah. thing on it in this it's it's in the chapter tokens yes yeah. uh so halle berry wins best actress uh the nominees that year were uh judy dench for iris nicole kimmon for moulin rouge sissy spacek for in the bedroom and renee zellweger for bridget jones really solid list i like all these performances yeah. sissy spacek was like the probably the performance that would have won if not for hallie yes she was the front runner for a majority of the season and she won the globe and are you going to read the passage from the book I will. after uh, despite the mirror max bucks behind in the bedroom uh Ortenberg saw it as the art house choice while Monsters Ball was playing more broadly. Uh, this is a uh, Lionsgate, I believe Lionsgate boss, right? Ortenberg? I, I should He's the Lionsgate president. Yeah. Uh, so he decided to position Barry, Barry as the populist candidate, especially given that she had just been picked as the next Bond girl and die another day. In late January, Barry lost the Golden Globe to SpaceX. Forster recalls, Hallie turned to me and said, this race ain't over yet. According to Forster, uh, they went over to talk with Warren Beatty, Barry's co-star from Bullworth, and he, quote, urged Hallie to reach out to the African-American community and get them behind the movie. With the 12 days before the Oscar nominations, Barry pulled off a coup, a full hour on the Oprah Winfrey show. Between raving about Barry's raw performance, raw in quotes, and Monster's Ball, which he claimed to have seen five times, and cooing over photos of Barry's top secret, quote, wedding to R&B singer Eric Benet, Winfrey delivered a priceless endorsement. I, quote, sent in my ballot already, she announced after the commercial break. I put Halle Berry in great big bold letters 
to nominate you for an Oscar. And I hope everybody does the same. Then she repeated, I put it in big black bold print so they can't miss it. Then Lee Daniel says, well, we still felt Barry was the underdog. We lost everything to Sissy Spacek, he recalls. We did not think she would win the Academy Award, but at least one Oscar player could tell that Lionsgate populist angle is working. Two days before the awards, Ortenberg had lunch with Weinstein. Fuck you, Weinstein told him. You beat us. What do you mean? Fuck you, you beat us. Hallie won and you know it and I know it. If there was anyone who could checkmate Harvey, it was Oprah. So. Yeah, so the turning point was when Hallie won SAG. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Hallie's speech is amazing. I was like, I think it's like one of the best speeches in here. It says that she got backlash after it because people like kind of made fun of her for being so happy to have won. But I really think that's such a shame. <laughs> and I think again, it's like, I don't think, obviously I don't think nowadays anybody would make fun of it, but it is a really no, good speech. Now everyone will be, you know, totally on her side. Yeah. But uh, I, she, I did remember that back then. Like there was a lot of just like, you know, hysterical woman type of thing. Yeah. we've talked about this we I, I personally and i think you too too we love when people show the actual true emotions they're feeling when they win there are more people are a lot more reserved now and so hallie like gets up to show emotion <laughs> and and she is literally hyperventilating I, in, in, in the oscar wars it's like russell crowe is like just breathe mate i think is what he tells her uh she says this moment is so much bigger than me this moment is for dorothy dandridge and lena horn diane carroll it's for the women who stand beside me jada pinkett angela bassett vivica fox and it's for every nameless, faceless woman of color that ha now has a chance because this door tonight has been opened. Thank you. I'm so honored. I'm so honored. I thank the Academy for choosing me to be the vessel for which his blessing might flow. But the sad thing is in this, I got to find it. Like she talks about, she like revisits that comment uh, because it didn't really turn out that way, obviously, until this year when Michelle Yeoh became only the second uh, woman of color to have won. She says, uh, I thought, oh, all these great scripts are going to come. It didn't happen. She didn't get the same opportunities. Um, yeah, just not not great. It just didn't happen. No, and honestly, when when it happened at the time, obviously great moment for her, um, deserved win. I, I think she she is really good in the movie. And um, yeah, historic win. And I remember just a lot of, again, the same thing. It's like, oh, we got two Black uh, lead acting winners. And I remember my friend, um, asking me like uh like has like because like the coverage was like oh she's the first black best actress winner so he was like is there like an asian best actress winner?" i was like nope <laughs> so like after the oscars i was like there's no like latino one either you know so after oscars it was like why isn't that that's what like people are talking about now like okay like when is that gonna be next like the next like asian one and i like i want to because they don't actually care it's like they're just happy to congratulate themselves now on this and you it seems like it's a a, a change but it's actually not because it's just you know it, it's like the end result of a larger problem because it starts at the beginning it's like you, you need to cast these people in these parts you need to write these people uh write roles for these type of people um or you know and cast them in roles that are like race neutral Yes. You know, so there's so there's this I have like two stories here um, from the New York Times. So one of them was before the Oscars on February 27th, 2002. And it's just it's the headline is black actors, colon, still keeping their eyes on the prize. <laughs> and it's just talking about like, like, what is what does this mean? You know, like these three uh, lead nominations. Um, so here's a quote from. Kwesi Mufome, the president of the NAACP. That's a real fear here. People asked me the other day, is this progress or a net gain? And I said, it's progress, but it's no net gain. Um, so that's just like, you know, background stuff like Sidney Poitier and how few Black performers um, have been acknowledged over the years. And then here's a quote from, where's her first name? Okay. Suzanne de Passe, a television and film producer. Um, and she's like, as, uh, oh, it doesn't mean the, the problem is solved um, because the, the worry is that 
with three lead acting nominees and a special Oscar to be presented to Mr. Poitier, as well as Oscar winner Miss Goldberg acting as MC. Uh, the event will be more of a celebration of achievements than an examination of roadblocks yet to be removed, which is true. And then uh, a quote from Darnell Hunt, the director of the Center for African American Studies at UCLA. Quote, it's promising, but the proof is in the pudding. Will this turn out to be more of a symbolic gesture than an indication that things are fundamentally changed? Hmm. And then after the Oscars, also in the New York Times, this was published March 25th, so the next day, headline, Hollywood questions the meaning of its historic Oscar night. <laughs> so the first quote here is from Spike Lee. Love Spike. I have found a Spike Lee quote, so this is great. Go ahead. I want to hear this one, and then I'll read you this one. Go ahead. It was like, it's easy for Hollywood to pat itself on the back and say, oh, that should satisfy them. That should keep them quiet for a while. But the same jubilation that people feel now, people were also probably feeling nearly 40 years ago in the aftermath of Sidney Poitier winning the first lead Oscar for a Black actor. I'm optimistic, but let's hope there's not another 40-year drought. And then he also has the closing quote, I believe. Um, right? Uh, yes. Uh, so the, the quote before is about, oh, you need to also like hire uh, people of color in executive positions and stuff like that. Um, and that's the only way to like fundamentally change the business in Hollywood. So as Mr. Lee agreed, quote, the real test comes in what happens next year or five years from now. I don't think any intelligent person would say this signals a great turnaround because really, who knows? No one has a crystal ball. We just have to hope that it marks real forward movement and is not just an aberration. So I have an article here from 2015, Spike Lee, after the Selma Oscar snubs from the Daily Beast. And it, it, Spike's, uh, that was what year is this? 2002 we're reading, right? Is that what it was? Yeah. So this is now 13 years later. Anyone who thinks, this is Spike Lee, quote, anyone who thinks this year was going to be like last year is our word, said Lee. There were a lot of Black folks up there with 12 years a slave, Steve McQueen, Lupita Nyong'o, Pharrell. It's in cycles of every 10 years. Once every 10 years or so, I get calls from journalists about how people are finally accepting Black films. Before last year, it was 2002 with Hallie, Denzel, and Sidney Poitier. It's a 10-year cycle, so I don't start doing backflips when it happens. This is Spike in 2015. Totally fair, yes. Fucking best. Spike yeah. rules. He's so good. It's just, it's like, he like, does not... Where, where is the lie? <laughs> Nowhere. He's so good. Yeah. Uh, just amazing. It, the Hall I found the Hallie quote. that was from. This was from 2016. It makes me so sad. Uh, we mentioned how she said, when the door was open. When I said the door tonight has been open, I believe that with every bone in my body, that this is going to incite change because this door, this barrier had been broken. And to sit here almost 15 years later in 2016 and knowing that another woman of color has not walked through that door, it is heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking because I thought that moment was bigger than me. And it's heartbreaking to start to think maybe it wasn't bigger than me. Mm -hmm. And it was in 2016 and we didn't have a woman of color one until this year. Yeah, and then Hallie also basically said the same thing last year because last year, 2022, was the 20th anniversary of her win. Just same same kind of sentiment. And it does, it, it sucks. And- yeah, like, I I mean, I just remember feeling, you know, like it, I was, I'm always been very cynical about Hollywood and the business. And like, I grew up like watching just white people basically in TV and film, like barely anyone who ever looked like me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was like white people and then like some black people sometimes and then maybe like one or two Asians and like Latinos and stuff. But like, I, I never, I'm just like, it. it's just, it's very, uh, it's a very passive reaction, right? For them to just celebrate this right now, but not actually make an active effort to try to continue it because they feel like they did the job by like just giving it to her finally after 74 years, which is a fucking long time. Yeah. <laughs> Way to give an actress of color an Oscar um, in the lead category. And so there's another quote from this, the, the postmortem story from... Reuben Cannon, who was, who in the 1970s became the first Black casting director for a major movie studio, um, said, quote, I am thrilled about what took place last night. It's, it is significant, but we should not mistake a moment for a movement. It's a significant moment. Whether it's a movement, only time will tell. And you know what? Time told. 
it did it was not a movement it was not a movement uh and, and like and the other thing about it too i think what's um really sad about you know like like hallie's uh i, I don't know like oscar resume i guess it's like she never even came close again to getting a second nomination she has not been nominated since so like that just tells you everything it does i will say like not to apologize for the industry i would never do that but in the thing it's like she talks about it in the oscars how it was like the idea was for her to be like a global superstar and the choices she made after the movie that after monster's ball did not work but the idea of it was she wanted to do like they she wanted to do a jinx movie which was her character in bond but mgm didn't think that would work but then they offered her she got offered catwoman and the idea was like man a black woman playing a superhero leading a movie like this for a global audience that's never been done before and uh it would be a great great thing and a great win for her and for the culture at large and the movie was awful and no one i don't think would defend that movie it's a real piece of shit and she, she accepted the razzie in person so and then she never really got anything else after that beyond like the x-men movies and whatever so it's like she didn't like unfortunately like didn't have like the many opportunities let's say that like white stars probably would have gotten yeah um, but you she need, wasn't trying i guess she wasn't trying for like like oscary roles she was doing like trying to do like tom cruise roles basically yeah but i think it's also like was she even getting offered those types of no those, probably those, not those, like oscar friendly roles right. right like it's she yeah, barely like, got offered this it sounded like because they thought she was like yeah she had to yeah she was too beautiful for it yeah right. that's that that was also part of like the narrative for her this year too um yeah it sucks it's like she i think she got a globe nomination for franny and alice a bunch of years ago yes and i think like that's been it and i think it's also it sucks because i think a, a lot of times too like you know like film twitter are I don't know like you just uh, or like if you look at someone who just won on their first nomination you can kind of look at them as a one-hit wonder right so it sucks she has not been able to get a sophomore nomination right. and you know it's not even like she she got like Amy Adams one year like she hit all the precursors and missed at the end you know so um but yeah you like if the opportunity is not there if no one is hiring you if no one is you know creating these projects for you that's also why she says she directed Bruised a couple yeah. years ago too you know so. I will say one of the things in her speech I thought was wonderful like I said one of the things I loved about this ceremony even though it's a four hour and four and a half hour ceremony is that they didn't even think of playing any of these people off all the speeches are like just going and yeah. like I I was like loving that because I think you get these great moments like her speech is a great moment I don't think I mean people made fun of it obviously but like no it's, it's a great speech and I'm just like she was so for as overwhelmed as she was she was also incredibly coherent because i would not have been able to give that speech no. uh, <laughs> under that kind of like duress and stress and just like you know vibrating of emotions um but yeah it was a great speech and uh yeah and then she you know presented best actress this year yep for michelle yeo Jessica Chastain to michelle yeo so yeah um yeah, I mean, Michelle Yeoh has got other... I think there are different stages in their career, so I think it's like apples to oranges, really, about like what that win will mean uh, for Michelle Yeoh, but, but like... Gotcha. Yeah, it's also, I would say, you know, like now or like the past couple years, it does feel like there is more of an active effort to, you, you know, um, put a spotlight and... Uh, green light projects for underrepresented uh, underrepresented groups yes it, so, it does it does still feel like to me though like looking at this year like we don't know what will happen right with like this year's movies and stuff but it does feel like there's only because of like they're just dominated by like white actors and like you know like there does feel like there's only a few movies maybe that have people of color in these lead roles and if they don't work for whatever reason then you're just screwed basically right or there's just not yeah you know, and i think there is still depth of bench like you know like last year with like the the woman king too i think there is still kind of like i i don't know like like they're the people are not or, or like the voting base or like you know these people who've been in the academy for decades um you know they they feel like this type of movie is not for them like we we heard you know a bunch of anonymous voters say that right and like Gina uh Prince Bifo you know said that too like people are just coming up to her at like 
telling her as if it's a compliment that, oh, I didn't want to see this movie, but my friend dragged me and I loved it, right? So it's like, you have to get beyond these like unconscious biases too. And I also wonder if, um, you know, some of these like uh, campaigns and like strategists, like because there's historically not a lot of, films with like you know in this case an all black female cast it's like they don't actually know how to campaign it and market it you know and like specifically for awards too I wonder if that's part of it because it's like we're we're just so used to like these auteurs and like all this other like your usual usual suspects right right so there was a quote in here too even like I mean even within like Angela Bassett who I think does, does she mention Angela Bassett in her speech I forget yeah, she's one of the people she names in the beginning. This is from Oscar Wars. Uh, it came under renewed scrutiny late months later in June when Angela Bassett, who had been nominated for What's Love Got to Do With It, made scathing remarks to Newsweek. She had turned down the role of Monsters Ball, she revealed, because, quote, I wasn't going to be a prostitute on film, even though the character was a waitress. And it's such a stereotype about Black women and sexuality. She didn't begrudge Hallie her success, but said, I would love to have an Oscar, but it has to be for something I can sleep at night. Yikes. Yeah, that was like a thing back then. And and then Lionsgate has said like Angela was never up for the role. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, who knows, but. Uh, best actress, who else did you, like I said, this was a good lineup and I think Hallie probably should have won. I don't like, I like, like Nicole Kidman in Moulin Rouge, but it's not like my favorite Nicole Kidman in Moulin Rouge. Like, so I'm fine with her not winning. Um, I... I mean, I prefer her Moulin Rouge performance to her hours performance, True. which she won next year for. By a nose. As yeah, by a nose. Says. Yeah. And yeah, I like this lineup. I love like Renee getting in. You know, she Renee's so a, good in Bridget. She Jones. got she got on a little streak here and then she finally won for Cold Mountain. Yes. Uh, in two years. So uh, obviously I wrote down Naomi Watts. I have Naomi Watts and Reese Witherspoon for Legally Blonde. Same. I have Thora Birch for Same. World. And Audrey Tateau for Amelie same uh so. not a lot not a lot of, not, as usual not a deep bench of uh dra- of actresses based on the industry no it, it had really kind of consolidated around these people um and uh judy also won um bafta again back when bafta was like still making up their own yes. decisions so yeah hallie won sag but did not obviously we said sissy space act won golden globe nicole kimman won golden globe sissy won critics choice awards judy won bafta um, we do screenplay, uh, Joyce. It's always our favor. Sure. Uh, we could go through these quick. Gosford Park won original screenplay for Julian Fellows. The other nominees were Amelie Memento, Monsters Ball, and the Royal Tenenbaums. Good list. I would have given it to Tenenbaums myself. Yeah, so Owen Wilson was on, I think, Kimmel a couple months ago, and he was talking about this and how he, um, like, they had no expectations of winning because it was like, oh, it'll, it'll be like Julian Fellows, you know? And, but then he said, like, when, when if Paltrow walked out and was like reading the nominees, he, like, in that moment, he was like, oh, we're winning. Like, I have to go and give a speech. And that just amazing. complete completion. <laughs> they have a great, uh, him and Ben Stiller have an amazing moment uh, for, I believe, costume design, I think they give out earlier in the yes. show. Yeah. Pre-taped bit, just fucking hilarious. I was laughing out loud. Like, the two of them are so funny. Owen dresses up as Harry Potter. Ben dresses up as, uh. John Reese Davis from uh, Lord of the Rings. Uh, and Ben is all pissy because he didn't get Oscar nominated. And Owen's like, sorry, we got an Oscar nomination. Wow. Made her. Wow. Uh, and it's like, great. It's just so good. <laughs> I love them. Love it so much. Um, yeah. I mean, I don't really have a problem with um, like the for Park land. No, this is a good category, fun. honestly. Yeah. I, I, the only ones I wrote down were like Moulin Rouge, Mel- Mulholland Drive, felt like they could have yeah. gotten Yeah, and then I also did The Man Who Wasn't There. Yeah, and I had Monsters, Inc. Because Shrek got in an animated, adapted, excuse me. Uh, so the adapted winner was Beautiful Mind for Akiva Goldsman, who Ron Howard calls Akiva Goldsmith at one point in his acceptance speech. Uh, Ghost World, great nomination. In the Bedroom, Lord of the Rings, and Shrek. This is a good list too. I would have given it to Ghost World, obviously. Uh, yeah, um, that would have been good. Um, but that again, that's just like a classic screenplay nomination, right? Yeah. Um, I would have nominated A Knight's Tale. Nice. Uh, by Brian Helgeland, former Oscar winner. 
I for would've... LA Confidential. Sure. Great, great script. Um, and also Ocean's Eleven. I had Ocean's Eleven, obviously. Great script. And I have Vanilla uh, Sky because I think that's a great script too. And it's an adaptation. Um, yeah, I also did Bridget Jones's Diary. Good movie. A good script. Uh, we want to expand. I thought we maybe would do song this year too, this this season. Uh, it was, if I didn't have you, Randy Newman, his first Oscar in 16 nominations. It's a big deal. People really loved it that he won. But you know who didn't win? Diane, Diane Warren. Warren. There you'll be. For oh, Pearl Harbor. Harbor. Yeah. Uh, um, you know, Three Small me? Words was robbed. Which one? Three Small Words. Three Small Words definitely was robbed. Vanilla Sky from Vanilla Sky. Paul McCartney couldn't pick that song out of a lineup. If you were playing it right now, I would never know what it was. Until from Kate and Leopold by Sting. Diane Warren, There You'll Be. And May It Be from Lord of the Rings. And then If I Didn't Have You from Monsters, Inc. from Randy Newman. Um, these songs are all fine. What a great time like for very, Randy very Newman. Very, very okay. What a great time for Randy Newman to win. He gets his Oscar from Jennifer Lopez, gives a nice speech and is like, I'm in heaven because there's Jennifer Lopez. It's kind of creepy, but I mean, it was a different time. Chalk yeah. it up for a different time. Um, yeah. And it, it, it's funny because like these titles are also like sort of interchangeable, except for Vanilla Sky. Yes. Love, love and titles are like that. <laughs> A uh, couple of things I wrote down, Joyce. Uh, we don't need to, we don't, we will not go for four hours on this, but I feel like this was a good show. Uh, this is a great moment in tabloid history because it's like maybe the beginning of the end of Ryan Phillippe and Reese Witherspoon. Uh, they give out best uh, makeup. And yeah, we, we talked about this last year in one episode of like when he, yeah, like he, he was about to open the envelope. And she goes, let me do it. And he goes, you make more than me. You make more than I do. Go ahead. Yeah, like, I like, this, this one of this is one of my top three memories of the ceremony. <laughs> it's a real fuck you, and then it's like not very nice, uh, and it comes across not very nice. And she seems well. He's also when when she's doing her spiel <laughs> while they're presenting, he just seems completely disinterested. Yes. Yeah. Uh, it it definitely is not not a great moment, and obviously they ended up breaking up. So. Uh, yeah, but not for another four years. Yes, and she wins an Oscar after this. Obviously. Yeah, she they they split like months after she wins yes so uh woody allen uh coming out Whoopi goldberg gives him a big uh big thing i gotta say what do you mean his little monologue made me laugh it was a big deal because it was he had never been to the oscars even though he had won yeah that was his thing like it, it, it's like katherine hepburn right yeah. she only ever made one appearance just to present so. and then the woody thing is online officially for the oscars and then the, he intros a movie montage put together by nora efron which is not online officially, but it is online and it's actually awesome. Like I love New York movies and I love New York movie montages. And I was like, this rules. It's so good. <laughs> Did you watch that at all? You should definitely watch it. It's really I good. I mean, I, I watched it when it aired. Sure. Well, that was 20 years ago. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, it was, I, I like, you know, uh, I like that the effort, I guess they made to acknowledge like New York, obviously they were doing it, you know, it was a big 9-11 yeah. so it was, a it, big, it was just funny because like you know the oscars are such a hollywood thing and they're just so like new york new york it, it we we were all new yorkers at the time Joyce. yes uh mm -hmm. kevin uh, speaking of canceled kevin spacey comes out to do the in memoriam and he gives a moment of silence for 9-11 first responders and those who lost their lives in 9-11 yeah. uh other stuff I wrote down, well, obviously the Sidney Poitier and Robert Redford Oscar moments, great. I thought Sidney Poitier used his entire speech to thank the people who had given him the opportunity to become Sidney Poitier, which I thought was like, really, I just was not expecting that even on rewatch. I guess, obviously, I remember from the time, but like, I was like, huh, that was like pretty uh, interesting yeah. way to do it. You know, uh, a great man. Um, really good. Did, did you ever watch the the Sydney doc? Yes. On Apple? Yeah. yeah. Really good. Mm -hmm. Uh, other thing I wrote down for the live action short movie, The Accountant wins, not the uh, Ben Affleck movie, The Accountant. No, and uh, Walton Goggin goes up, but he does not win an Oscar. So he's holding an Oscar though, Joyce. I wrote this down because I was like, I know you love Walton Goggins and there he is holding an Oscar. No, I, I remember this when it happened. Um, and that this is also, well, The Shield premiered, had premiered by then. And then uh, but obviously before Justified too. And also before Rectify, Ray McKinnon who does win an Oscar along with uh, Lisa Blount, his wife, RIP. Yes. So the, so the two of them win. And um, Walton is a producer. He's 
I think he's a producer, but he is not credited for the win. And the other two, I think, are EPs, but they are credited. Yes. Or maybe it's the other way around. But yeah, he goes up with them and like he's holding the statuette and he's so excited. And he kind of pulls a uh, like a Matt Damon when he and Ben won for Good Will Hunting. Like you can see a register on Matt while Ben is giving the speech and he starts getting excited and like whooping. And that's what Walton does. Pretty great. Yeah. Um, well said I write down. Uh nothing else really. I mean, that was it. It's a long ass show. Uh four and a half hours. Yeah. Um this I I, I don't even know. Well, it had the ratings were it had forty one point eight two million people, which was just about a million less people from the year before when Gladiator won. And I will say, like the movies that were nominated as your Lord of the Rings accepted, not the most uh widely not not a lot of big box office hits here. Well, also the year before was probably an hour shorter, right? <laughs> it was literally an hour shorter as well. Okay, yeah, there you go. People um, went to bed. I thought Whoopi did a fine job hosting. This is her fourth yeah. time hosting. Totally, totally fine. She ends the show with like showing support for first responders and like turning around and she's got them on her back. It reminded me of the dress AOC wore to the Met Gala about like eat the rich or whatever that said. Do you remember that like last year? Yes, yeah um i i I had to imagine like she must have been exhausted by the end i mean she from the beginning was like this is going to be long strap in yeah basically and it sure was uh yeah that was it that's the 2002 oscars i i like i said this is a totally like it's a weird oscars to me because it's like obviously you have these massive historic wins in in halle berry and denzel washington and the sydney poitier on the oscar and then everything else is just like kind of whatever i mean i don't think beautiful mind is really a movie people are thinking about or watching a lot in uh it anymore no um and it's definitely one where i think if like people had to redo the vote they would pick something else it does yeah. seem that way i mean it's just not not yeah not not a great I don't know. I, I just am like, it's totally fine. It just feels like the whole thing feels like a makeup. Like we should have given it to Apollo 13. So we're just going to give it to Beautiful Mind. That's what a lot of it feels like. I don't know. Yeah. And like some of these other like below the line wins were um, fun or I liked um, like Howard Shore for original score for Lord of the Rings. A great win. We didn't we didn't talk about original score, but it is a great list of nominees. Howard Shore, John Williams for AI, John Williams for Harry Potter. A Beautiful Mind, James Horner, and Randy Newman from Monsters, Inc. Uh, Howard Shore is great. Harry Potter, John Williams' Harry Potter theme is obviously iconic, but I mean, like, I think that's fine that he didn't win for it. Um, I would I would have also done the Ocean's Eleven score. <laughs> obviously, Dave Holmes' score rules. 100% would have done that. Yeah. Um, and then, what else is there here? I don't know um shrek when animated first time we did an animated feature shrek wins yeah obviously uh i, I think do you think shrek would have won today or would have monsters inc this is like a good like monsters inc is a, a really good pixar movie um i think shrek would have still won shrek was the bigger deal i guess but yeah. like monsters inc is like legitimately good no i think shrek would have won just because it was bigger and they're kind of lazy here too like they tend to just go with like the bigger film mm -hmm. here um and then oh um oh editing so black hawk down one editing yes and um so uh, pietro scalia did not win the previous year for gladiator because traffic won um, that's that that was a tough race um and i don't really have an issue with black hawk down winning but i would have given it to lord of the rings or memento <laughs> I think creatively, one of those two would have been better. Maybe Memento, certainly, but I do think Black Hawk Down winning is pretty boss. Like it's it's kind of it's like one of, it's like the Matrix and Born Ultimatum winning, everything. Right. Yeah. So, and then I don't know what else is there. Like obviously, visual effects, Lord of the Rings, costume design, Mulan, Rudy, yeah, Catherine Martin did not work out for her this year with the double costume and production design, then known as art direction, but. She did it here for Moulin Rouge. <laughs> uh, still, still crazy that she didn't win. That Elvis won nothing this year. Um, yeah, that's it, Joy. So we're going to be we're going to be doing these uh, all summer. Eight, eight of these. 
We'll be back, I guess. Eight is enough. Eight is enough until next season. So we'll be back next week with the 75th Annual Academy Awards. And Um, Yeah, that ceremony has my favorite Oscar win of all time. Hmm. Don't tell me what it is. We'll find out next week. All right. There you go. Bye, Joyce. Thank you.